Good evening. Welcome to this evening, Monday, November 27th, school board meeting, 2017. Uh, love to see a jam-packed board meeting. It's usually like this, just to do different cast of characters. So, all right, maybe not. Uh, but thank you for coming. And we do have a couple spotlights. Uh, the first, we are going to honor and spotlight our Vote Yes Committee. I'll turn it over to our uh, district communications staff, Sarah Thompson. Thank you, Chair Hirosh. I am pleased to introduce our parent volunteers who spearheaded the Vote Yes Committee um, for the past three, we'll go, we'll go almost four months um, leading up to the referendum. They worked tirelessly on behalf of our students to share the information, not only what the district was providing, but the parent perspective on why this referendum was so important. I have three of them with me tonight. I have two more at home, but we'll introduce the first three that um, were able to make it here tonight. Colin Cox. Julie Yakes, and Carrie Jennison. So not able to join us tonight were Nick Fernakis, Maida Webb, and Matt Walsh. They had other commitments tonight, and they were also um, very key in the campaign. We had long and short, probably 500 plus parent volunteers that participated at some point in the campaign, as well as just a huge thank you to all voters who turned out on election day. So one more round of applause for these people. Okay. I need to take a just before you sit down though, I uh, just, and I said at last meeting though, uh, we were, our district, uh, I don't think I've been disproven yet, but I did look, uh, at least of all the AMSD, Association of Metropolitan School Districts, we passed our referendum by a high, higher margin than any other district. Um, so I think, you know, the message was communicated really well and ran a really terrific campaign for the schools and to the kids. So really, we thank you very much and did a great job. Thanks. <laughs> All right. And I will turn it over back to the chair. All right, our next spotlight are the 2017 Fall Athletic State participants and our athletic director, Andy Ewald, will present. Thank you ha for having me here tonight, school board. Um, we had a great fall. When I was here in September, we talked about how last year went as a whole and this fall trumped last year um, by a mile besides the coaches that are going to get up and speak about their athletes that are here tonight. Um, girls soccer finished second in the Metro West Conference. Boys soccer finished first in the Metro West Conference and they were section runner up. Girls tennis finished second in the Metro West Conference and girls volleyball finished third in the Metro West Conference on top of the wonderful things that we're going to hear about these three, three programs that are here tonight. So first I'm going to ask Chris Nordstrom, our head cross country coach, to come on up here and talk for a minute and introduce our guest from cross country. Thank you very much. Uh, glad to be here. Um, it was a very exciting season. As uh, some of you may know, it was my first year as head cross country coach. Um, I ran for Park back in the day, graduated from 2005, and uh, have been coaching, coaching now for five years. Uh, my first as the head coach, and was excited to take over a program that I, I thought had a lot of promise, um, especially on the girls' side. Um, very exciting um, time right now to, to have such a young team, and, and we really had high aspirations in, in our conference um, meet. As some of you may not know, our section um, is 6AA, and it's the toughest section in the entire Midwest. Um, we have multiple nationally ranked teams on both the guys and the girls' side in our section. So we really put a lot of emphasis on our conference meet and really trying to place well and represent um, our conference well. The boys' side uh, kind of had an up and down year, and we ended up fifth in the conference. We were hoping to be top four, so it didn't go as well as, as we had hoped, but it went well. And um, on the girls' side, we were hoping to be you know, third or better, and we finished third, which I think is from what I've looked at, maybe the best we've ever finished in the conference as a girls cross country team. So it was really exciting for that. 
Um, and our young lady who I'll be speaking more about, um, that was actually one of her toughest races of the year. She finished fourth, so she did well. But um, kind of going, going forward to our section meet, um, Josie Mosby, who's our eighth grader who qualified, we weren't really sure where she was at. And um, again, we are in one of the toughest sections in the Midwest. Um, Wyzetta right now is ranked second in the country um, in cross country for girls. And they have the national meet next week and they have a shot to win it. So that's some of the competition that we're going up against. And um, we weren't really sure. We knew she was gonna be close. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much details. I could talk about it for the entire meeting if I needed to. Um, but she gave herself a shot and um, it, it was cool because when we finished, when she finished, we actually didn't know because they take uh, the team qualifiers out and then they go individuals from there. So you have to be top eight um, after they take the team qualifiers out. I actually thought she didn't make it. Um, she is asking, did I make it? Did I make it? I was like, to be honest, I, I don't think you did, but I'm not sure. I went and cheered on the boys and then she was upset and bummed and thought she didn't make it. Um, by the end of the boys race, um, my other assistant coach had looked on his phone and the results were up and we counted and she was the last qualifier and was able to share that with her. So, um, and she went down to state um, the week after, battled really hard. Our goal was to finish in the top 50. She finished 56th as an eighth grader, which is um, just extremely impressive. And the sky's the limit for her. So I'd like to uh, congratulate Josie Mosby. And if her parents, Ken and Tony, could just stand up, we could recognize them for all their support. Thank you, Ken and Tony. Joe, if you could come up. Joe Yeager, our head girl swim coach. He's, Joe is also an alum. He works here in the district, and I'll say that about Chris as well, being an alum. He works in the district at the middle school and lives in St. Louis Park, so he's parked through and through. Thank you for having us tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about a small part of our team that finished second in our conference overall this year, which is a huge accomplishment. Um, these girls overcome uh, no diving, so when we swim against other teams, they'll dive against us, and they overcame that year, this that this year, and finished second in the conference. We also, they also finished fourth in the section, and then I'm going to introduce the uh, state girls, and you girls can come up at this time. Our 200 medley relay consisted of. Um, Claudia Stone, Hattie Kugler, Franny Bevel, and Lexi Lee. Claudia, Franny. Also with those girls, Sarah Anderson, Ellie Grassley, Maisie Lansbury, and Grace Loveland were also part of that team. Now, the funny thing about this relay team was that uh, they gave themselves no padding. They had to meet one certain time. They hit that time dead on to make it to state. So they did an outstanding job. And then Hattie Kugler also finished second in the section in the 100 breasts and finished 17th overall at state. And if, if the parents of any of the eight of them are here, if you could stand up and be recognized as well, please. Uh, 
And lastly, I'll ask Ben Wolf, our head football coach, to come up here. Um, I'm just going to take this opportunity to congratulate Ben. He was named the CARE 11 Coach of the Year for Minnesota State High School football. Thank you, Andy, for that shout out. And uh, school board, thank you guys for having us here. Um, it's been a really awesome, historical, epic season in a lot of different ways. Um, first winning season since 1972. First trip to state for, and for the school history. Um, you know, in the course of these last couple weeks as we've wrapped up the state tournament, we've had a lot of opportunities to reflect back on what's made the season so, so special and so successful. And it's, it's a lot of work by a lot of different people an amazing coaching staff. Our kids dedicated themselves in the weight room and on the field to doing things the right way. They're dedicated in the classroom. We have a, a tremendous just student athlete group of kids here. Um, the future for St. Louis Park football is very bright and we're really excited about this season that we had. Um, we had an opportunity to go to the state tournament. It was a once in a lifetime opportunity and we hope to be back. Um, it was just really, really a lot of fun. We, we had an awesome section championship game against the Crosstown rival in Cooper. And, you know, when we started this thing five years ago, this is what we wanted to be about. We wanted it to be about competitive football and, and kids playing the game the right way and, and trips to the postseason and trips to state. And uh, it, it's really cool to look back and, and know that we got there this year and, and uh, there's, there's plenty more to come as we go. So uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize the many student athletes that we have here. They're the uh, platinum blonde individuals that are <laughs> so finally sitting over here. Um, I'll just point out there's a lot of multi-student athletes in this group and a lot of really uh, great academic student athletes in this group as well. And uh, maybe rec rec recognize our parents as well for uh, being here. You can call them all up. What do you want to do? Do you want to go name by name? Sure. Uh, uh, for, for those that are here and not here, Karan Adams, Adam Bauer, Jacob Brown. Alejandro, Caceres, Aranda. Come on up, fellas, when you hear your names called. Alejandro's here. Tony Christensen. Zach Corporon. AJ Datt. Mil Queso de Defo. Joseph Donahue. McCabe Dvorak. Riley Dvorak, Aaron Ellingson, Charles Evans, Cole Ewald, Achille Ferris, Skyler Glover, David Gutierrez, Alex Hager, Noah Hauser, Brendan Johnson Snyders, Ryan Clares, Eli Kozak, Jerry O. Lopez Barrera, Ivan Lopez Perez. It's not too late. Get in there. Kimon Malone, Armando Morelli, Kai McKee, Nick Medina. Samaje Mitchell, Peyton Morrison, Zach Munson, Sajid Natham, Jake Olson, Tucker Olson, Carl Ordo Ordorf, Alex Riley, Jacob Riley, Skyler Rodelius Palmer. Aaron Sledge, Josh Smith, Josh Samaya, Johnny Sorensen, Tony Stadler, Latrell Thornton, Sam Tyne, Jack Townsend, Christian Vega, and John Demesiak. One more time, a round of applause for a 2017 state football qualifying team and section champions. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much.
like some of you kneel down. Front row kneel down. Let's go three levels. Yeah. Come on. Uh, three levels. Kneel standing. Kneel standing. <laughs> <laughs> Jim just Jim asked me just to recognize the two assistant coaches that were here and then ask the parents to stand up. Really quick, if the parents could stand up quickly, the board chair asked those parents to stand up and be recognized, please. So thank you. And then also uh, Scott Glover and Rob Griffin, two of the assistant coaches that are here and have put a ton of work in, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations to uh, all our athletes. We're honored. Uh, it's great stuff. And I know we're doing it in the classroom, too. So that's awesome. Um, you're welcome to stay here about our wonderful audit. Thank you, Esther. But if not, we'll take uh, two minutes and let everyone, those who aren't interested in staying. All right. All right. Well, that was fun. Uh, one or two people cleared out, so we're ready to resume. Uh, we are on to approval of our agenda. Uh, on this evening's agenda, we have the approval of the agenda. We have open forum, superintendent's report. The discussion items are the audit report for 2017, uh, construction management as agent discussion, policy development first reading, policy 533 wellness, uh, next item would be policy development, our second reading on policy 612.1, development of parental involvement Title I programs. Next, we have our consent agenda, followed by our action agenda, which is the approval of the 2017 audit, uh, construction management as agent approval, the 2018-2019 open enrollment affirmation, uh, policy development second reading approval of policy 612.1 development uh, excuse me development of parental involvement title one programs renamed parent guardian and family engagement policies for title one programs next item is the employment contract approval school nutrition 2017 18 and 2018 19 and we'll have our communications and transmittals and adjournment I would entertain a motion to approve tonight's agenda Moved by Bruce, seconded by Joe. Thank you. Uh, any comments? The agenda. All, right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes 7 0. And we are on to the open forum. Seeing has, nobody has filled out a card and no one wants to speak to us, we will move on to our next <laughs> item the superintendent's report. Uh, good evening, Chair Yarosh and members of the board. I it's hard to um, do a report after that um, acknowledgement of all of our wonderful students and, and families and community members that supported us on the Vote Yes Committee. But um, it, it really just resonated or reminded me, what, what's resonating with me right now is the first sentence of our mission where we talk about as a caring, diverse community with the tradition of putting the students first, um, that we will ensure students attain their highest level of achievement. And as I look around the room and think about the accomplishments that we um, heard 
displayed there to this evening. It just really speaks to that and um, also just the community support. You know, as I went around the room and, and introduced myself to families, the, the level of excitement um, that they had for their children's success um, just really speaks volumes. So that was exciting. I don't even, I have a report. I don't want to give it because it's like, what do you say after that? But I'll, I'll, I'll proceed anyways, right? Um, the first thing that I wanted to just share um, is that this week, and I'm, I'm a little biased as uh, a parent of a kindergartner next year, that we have kindergarten um, information night starting on Thursday. So the class of 2031 will begin their um, experience here as kindergartners in the St. Louis Park Public School District. And um, Thursday, November 30th, from 6.30 to 8 p.m., Aquila, Peter Hobart, Susan Lindgren um, will be hosting their kindergarten information night. And then on December 5th, um, from 6.30 to 8 p.m., Park Spanish Immersion will be hosting their kindergarten information night. Um, I, I would like to um, just acknowledge this group and the reason that I would like to acknowledge this group is because the work that they're doing on um, the Youth Development Committee, YDC, really speaks to one of our core values around everyone has the capacity and responsibility to contribute to the well-being of others. Um, specifically, this group of students will be hosting a coat drive to assist families in the St. Louis Park um, area starting Monday. Um, well, it started Monday, December 20th, and will go through um, December 4th. And this group has a goal of collecting 500 coats, and um, this, is, this group is um, comprised of students who are in grades 6 through 12 working together to develop leadership skills, foster service learning, and have a positive impact on the community. I would also like to um, congratulate the 27 middle school students in our English Learner Program um, for achieving proficiency in academic English. These students' achievement exemplifies our core value that through persistent effort in an equitable environment, everyone can achieve maximum performance. Um, learning a language requires persistence and risk taking and these emerging bilingual students have demonstrated this through their academic performance. Lastly, um, I would like to acknowledge um, the middle school students that participated recently in the Spelling Bee that was um, held earlier this month. Uh, the competition included 161 words spelled and the St. Louis Park Middle School representative um, that advanced to the Metro Area Spelling Bee that will be held in March is um, Sophia Curran Moore and the runner up was Nevea Dubine. And this concludes my superintendent's report for this evening. Okay. Thank you, Superintendent Osai. We move on to our discussion items, and the first item is our audit report 2017. And uh, Ryan Inglestead from uh, Baker Tilly, right? Yep. Yes. Uh, we'll uh, uh, give our how we did. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, good evening. It's good to be here with you again this year uh, to pr present the uh, result of the uh, audit work that we did for the district for fiscal year 17. And uh, I'll keep my uh, comments here rather brief. Had the opportunity to meet with the board uh, prior, uh, prior to this meeting here uh, to go over the information in a bit more detail. So uh, I guess first off, uh, I just want to express our appreciation and, and, uh, uh, and also uh, kudos to uh, those involved at the district. Uh, uh, we, our team that was here on site uh, received uh, full cooperation, uh, prompt responses to our requests, and and questions answered in a, in a timely manner. So that always helps with uh, having the audit process go the way that, uh, the way that we like it to. Uh, from there, I'll uh, make some comments here briefly on the audited financial statements. Uh, so first off, uh, uh, the opinion that we're offering uh, are included within the, the draft of the financial statements here that will uh, remain intact with the finals, of course, is an unmodified opinion. Uh, that's the highest grade uh, per se that we can provide uh, with respect to the accuracy of the financial statements. Uh, now, I, uh, with that, I, I do also uh, make a point to say as part of these presentations that uh, annual financial statement audits are designed in such a way that uh, we're providing reasonable assurance with regards to the accuracy of the financial statements versus absolute assurance as, as there is uh, materiality and sampling and so on and so forth that's built into uh, the pr procedures that we're performing, obviously not looking at that all transactions uh, that were recorded uh, for, the, for the fiscal year. Uh, that being said, uh, the way the audit risk formula works, it is meant to provide at least 90% confidence in the accuracy of the financial statements. As far as uh, uh, 
uh, a brief recap of the results uh, for fiscal 17. Uh, I'll start first with the district-wide financial statements, and these are on a full accrual basis. These, aren't, these are different from those financial statements that are uh, set up by individual funds, general funds, so on and uh, so, on and so forth. Uh, so for the district-wide statements that are on a full accrual basis, which picks up long-term obligations for uh, pension benefits and, and lo other uh, long-term debt related to uh, uh, bonds payable that are outstanding, uh, things like that, uh, uh, there was an overall, uh, on the statement of activities for those district-wide uh, statements, there was an overall decrease in, in the net position of a fairly substantial number. And before I even say the number, I, I will say it was all driven by a change in the assumptions uh, that were connected to that are connected to the TRA uh, pension liability. So those changes uh, in in the assumptions that were made during fiscal 17 at TRA actually caused a roughly 20 million dollar decrease in that overall net position for the district. Again, it's a, it's a non-cash uh, expenditure, and those uh, estimates will again continue to change over time using the best information that's out there. But, Excuse me, Ryan, could yep. you explain TRA? So oh yes, the that's, that's the Teachers Retirement Association. Uh, so the majority of the, uh, so there's the two, two pension plans that impact uh, employees of the district, the TRA and then uh, PARA, uh, the Public Employees Retirement Association that covers those on the, on the administration and the staff side. And, and who or what dictated those assumptions that changed? Uh, it's all based on looking at uh, uh, future projected earnings on those investments uh, that are part of that are part of that. So was uh, it the pool. TRA manager, whoever that is? Uh, yeah, or? TRA along with their actuaries. Okay. Uh, that that d developed those changes. So. So Ryan, those changes that were made not by us but by the TRA group, they apply not just to our district but to all well all districts and broader yeah. than that. I mean, just but, to make sure that. In theory, on the books is enough to pay pensions when they come due. Is that, it, that that's exactly right? So all districts are facing the same situation. So when you look at the the, the net position on that district-wide balance sheet, um, most all districts are actually going to show a deficit number because of those estimated pension obligations that are out there. Uh, but credit agent credit rating agencies knew about uh, these obligations even be, so. Actually, fiscal 16 was the first year that those obligations came on the financial statements for governmental entities. Uh, so it was rather eye-opening, but all in all, it didn't really change the, how the credit rating agencies um, perceived uh, local governments uh, just because of the fact that they knew those obligations were out there, even though they, they weren't actually on the balance sheet previously. So, uh, th so then moving to the uh, financial statements that are set up on an individual fund basis, which is how budgeting happens and, and such, uh, and obviously the main focus there is the general fund. Uh, for the year, on a, on a budget of roughly $60 million, uh, the, the result was a, a net decrease of about $300,000 uh, expenditures over revenues. Uh, so about as, uh, as far as that overall net result, about as close to break even as you can get uh, for, the, for the fiscal year. And most of that uh, excess on the expenditure side tied back to uh, ex expenditures like uh, for repairs and maintenance and, and that type of thing, uh, not necessarily as much on the, on the salaries or other, other types of op operating expenses. Yep. I'm just gonna pause you, and, and we should let the public know that we met uh, with our auditors for a while before this board meeting. Uh, but Sandy, maybe we can chime, you know, we were looking at the variances on that final budget and the, the sites and buildings w was about 1.8 million. What, you know, and that, as Ryan was saying, that kind of led to the, 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 the difference. What is that? Is that, I know we don't get a lot in capital dollars. Is that capital dollars being shifted that we're using out of, out of our general fund? Um, you're referring to the capital, operating capital, I'm, I'm assuming. Well, I'm looking at the general fund, okay, general fund on page yeah. on 52, and that the variance. The capital as well. And, and yeah, that there was a, a various um, repairs that needed to be done. We're in arrears, as we all know. Um, and there was some compliance issues that our facility manager felt needed to be done um, immediately rather than waiting. And, and in order to be in compliance with other federal and state agencies um, that needed those repairs to be done. So normally we know our capital budget is, is insufficient, which is why we go out 
that when we have to for deferred maintenance. So you're saying these are items that couldn't have been deferred because of compliance issues. Yes, of course. And, and is this number, this variance, is it bigger than normal? Uh, I, I'm trying to remember from prior years. It seemed a little high as all. Well, it, it's, it's bigger than normal. I mean, we've been probably within the 100,000 of, of expenditures. Um, this one dipped in a little bit more. Um, fortunately, we had some revenue um, sources that came in as well that offset that. Um, so it didn't affect that overall um, fund balance. It actually, um, I think with the revenue sources that came in, I believe we had a little windfall with the revenues for the special ed. Um, so that helped out that situation and we knew that was coming, but we also knew that this was coming into play as well. Yeah, I know, understand sometimes things come up and they have to be done, but you know, we prefer to use our general fund for um, student needs, not capital needs. So if there's a way to defer and not do that, that would be the board's preference. My preference anyway as a member of the board. And actually, this was actually for repairs, so we have to use general fund money for repairs. I just wanted to, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now I feel better. Yep. All right, okay. it, yep. one last comment I'll have re with regards to the general fund is that, uh, so even with that uh, net $300,000 increase or decrease for the year, uh, the, over, the unassigned fund balance position within the general fund uh, still came out to be, I don't know the uh, exact dollar amount without flipping to the right page here, but uh, percentage-wise it was just under 12% just under 12 of the annual expenditures for the general fund, which is viewed as being a healthy uh, fund balance. The, the minimum target often is to have one month of coverage, so that comes out to be you know, somewhere between eight and nine percent. Uh, so being at just shy of 12 percent, uh, certainly a good position for the district. All right, uh, as far as the balance of the, uh, the financial statements report, there's um, several pages of footnote disclosures. Those are all very consistent and, and, uh, and, and clear uh, as far as in, in comparison to previous years. Uh, I'll move on then to uh, two other side and uh, separate engagements that we also perform uh, as part of the annual audit. Uh, the next one I'll talk about is on re with respect to the federal award programs. And uh, the, the two uh, grant programs that we were required to audit this year as major programs were the food service area, the child nutrition cluster, and then also the I3 grant. Uh, as part of our testing, uh, and you may recall during fiscal 16, we did have uh, some findings that surfaced as part of that, uh, part of our uh, procedures that we performed on the food service area. And those uh, exceptions uh, did resurface again this year. Slightly different uh, uh, in, in nature, but uh, still getting at the, the same uh, requirements and regulations. Uh, so based on the exceptions we had there, uh, we will have uh, reportable findings uh, that will be submitted to the federal government uh, in, in that respect. Uh, and then also uh, for the I-3 grant, I'll mention that uh, uh, in that area we did not have any exceptions uh, that surfaced as, as part of the testing uh, re related to that program. So, uh, then uh, the last engagement I'll refer to here then is the, the work that we do on the student activity funds. Uh, so as part of our testing this year, uh, we select samples of both disbursements and receipts as we do each year uh, and as part of that we did see some improvements that were made over uh, uh, what, what we had seen in, in previous years. So for example uh, for the senior high activity funds uh, the, the required two signatures were now on all of the checks that we selected for testing uh, so that was a, a nice improvement there. Uh, on the junior high side the activity of course isn't nearly as significant but on that side, uh, we still do have the finding for only having one signature on the checks. Uh, the other finding we have is related to the, the timeliness of the, uh, uh, the receipts getting deposited in, into the bank. Uh, so of our sample, uh, we did find a similar number as to what we had the previous year, uh, where under the guidelines that are set up by the state, it would be viewed as being, an, uh, those, those would be viewed as being untimely deposits. So we just continue to recommend that efforts are made to, to get those funds uh, centralized and, and submitted to the bank as, as quickly as possible uh, within one week is the, is the preference. And then I, I should also note, so switching, a, switching away from the student activity funds, but one thing tied to the, to the audit overall, uh, more, more directly to the, 
the, the main financial statement audit, uh, but we do also have a similar finding this year uh, uh, related to the, uh, to the fact that us as the audit firm are relied upon to prepare the, the full set of the financial statements, including all the footnote disclosures. Uh, so that is a requirement under the audit standards that if in a situation like that, uh, that by default is viewed as being an internal control weakness. So we do have that, uh, that finding included uh, this year as well. That being said, that one is very common uh, for uh, local governments, uh, school districts, uh, and, and those, of, those of your size. Uh, and most organizations do a cost-benefit assessment as to whether it makes sense to, to have uh, someone on your staff or hire an additional staff, uh, 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 but having someone on your staff go through all the necessary training each year and, and things like that to keep up with all the, all the requirements. Uh, and most decide that the cost benefit uh, it just isn't there or it doesn't make sense uh, from that perspective. So, uh, so that is a recap of the uh, results of the audit work uh, that we did for this year. So I'd be glad to uh, field any other, any other questions anyone may have. Ryan, good to see you again. You do a good great job you. for us every year. I just want to um, be sure I understood. It's an unmodified opinion, which is the highest grade opinion you can give as an auditor having looked at our books? That's correct, yes. Could yes, and a, an, a, an unmodified opinion is the, the best result uh, you can look for, and it's often referred to as a, as a clean opinion. So yes, uh, congratulations on, on that. And also I'd like to congratulate the district on, on the referendum uh, that you're uh, uh, able to pass, and it just shows that, um, as, as was alluded to earlier, the, the the, the fact that the, the community, community is behind the district 100% and it's, it's always great to work with organizations like that. So thank you and, and uh, yep. Uh, Ryan, we, we all thank you. We yep. appreciate, and, and again, having the consistency of an auditor who knows us, and Ryan has been with us a number of years. Yes. Uh, so, and he's now a partner in his firm, and, and that's, again, that's great connections for us. To, he knows us, he knows how, how we do things. But I also want to give a shout out to Sandy and her team. Uh, as Ryan said, we, we have a, a clean or an unmodified opinion. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, you've read, you see things in the papers about scandals and people doing things with money that they shouldn't be doing. And as Ryan alluded to, it's not perfect, but it's reasonably correct. And it, the, the work that they put in to get this unqualified opinion every year or, or unmodified opinion. Uh, as a recovering CPA, I know what they have to do, and I appreciate the work that both teams go into to make sure this thing happens and happens correctly. And as far as writing up of our financial statements, I've done that in $200 million companies, so that, that happens in a lot of cases. Yeah. So uh, again, great work, Sandy, and thank you. Yes, thank you, and, and thank you, Sandy, as well. Uh, we, we certainly, uh, again, appreciate all the cooperation. It's a, it's a pleasure working with the district. So, thank you. Good. Thank you. Right. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, our next discussion item is uh, the construction management as agent discussion, and our Director of Business Services, Sandy Celine, will present this item. Um, I did provide the board um, copies of AIA contracts, um, which is for our construction manager. And these are standard contracts that we have to use in construction businesses um, to, um, to um, have the certain language in there that is required. Um, so there's nothing out of, the, out of the norm that is in this contract. And what this contract is for is you know, beans that we have 100.9 million that we have to do construction, we would like to hire a construction manager um, to help with this process um, to make sure it goes as smooth as possible um, in, in dealing with timeliness, in dealing with contractors, subcontractors, and so forth. Um, Tom Bravo does a great job, um, but I think this is a pretty big project to be doing by himself so so what we have done is we went through and um, invited three um, um, con construction managers in to interview and it consisted of administration um, principals um, who who went through and listened to um, three of these companies um, tell us about themselves 
And looking at the three, um, there was various um, different um, ideas that we, we looked through as far as um, who to pick, um, but we did um, look at the different options and looked at Kraus Anderson as the best option. Um, they were um, the lowest cost as well, and it wasn't necessarily just that that we um, decided on picking Kraus Anderson. Um, they do have 40 to 50 percent of um, CM work in in the school districts in the state of Minnesota right now, so so they are very well versed. I personally have worked with them in other districts, so um, I do um, recommend that they would do the job for us. Um, so therefore, unless there's any questions, um, I would recommend to the board um, to approve their contract. So, so Sandy, I'm, I'm just interpreting that to mean that they're going to be our owner's rep. Our Absolutely. All of these contracts. Yep. Tom Bravo so will be in charge of everything. Um, they're going to be basically the support for him to be able to get this job done. And, and with that added support, it's going to help us get everything done on time, even though it's construction. Absolutely. <laughs> we're we're going to make every attempt to do so. Sure. And uh, maybe this is slightly off topic, but what is, do you have a plan as to how often you'll be reporting to us in terms of progress? I mean, it's a, yeah. maybe a ways off, but. Um, the plan right now is to once a month have um, a report for the board around uh, the projects, the construction, and you know, starting to, so next month we'll, we'll come with a report and just a status update of the work we've had with the construction management as agent firm if the, if Carl Sanderson is approved tonight. And it will more so look like in December, look at the teams that we've developed and the work that they're doing to get the designs so that we can start the construction in a timely fashion. So to your question, yes, we have a plan that once a month we'll provide the board an update. Thank you. Bruce? Uh, Cunningham will still continue as the architects? That's correct. We will be bringing that to the December meeting okay. on are, their contract. Are there other construction firms actually as far as approved bids out right now? Not right now. Okay. Thank Not you. at this point. Sandy, can you also talk about the other architecture firm that will support us with the deferred maintenance um, projects? Um, we'll have various um, um, construction um, architect firms. Um, um, one being we will have, of course, Cunningham, which we will bring, ask the board to approve at the December <laughs> meeting. They will be our overall construction management, or not a construction, our architect firm um, who will be in charge of this whole process. Um, we will be using other um, architectural firm, firms as well, um, such as ATSNR, who will be helping with our our school nutrition program, um, the kitchens and that type of thing. Um, Wold Architect does know our um, our systems, our HVAC systems. So there is a a a request from our actually our facility manager to keep using them in some aspect of, of that HVAC system work, um, since that it they do have. Um, um, it would be more efficient using them in that purpose. Um, so there will be others that we will be pulling in for certain things and deferred maintenance and, and things like that. But for the most part, Cunningham will be in charge of the overall um, control of that. Yes. You also have plans to have uh, a different architect for the fitness center or using just? Um, I haven't gotten that, um, but you know, we certainly can have those conversations if, yeah, if that's the case. I think it, it, it maybe you pointed out, but I didn't hear it. Um, it. This was budgeted. The fee for the construction manager was budgeted already. And mm -hmm. given the size and the scope of this project, I think it is uh, essential that we do have a construction manager. Uh, just uh, curious, and I don't have a dog in the fight or anything, but I know I think I think it's A and P, Adelson and Peterson, and they're they're in St. Louis Park. Uh, they I believe they did our 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 last big project, uh, the gyms and the science. Uh, I'm just curious. Did they not respond? Did we, they did we send not, it out? Okay. Yeah, they they refused to to bid for that, and and but they were invited. Okay. All right. Any other questions of Sandy? All right. This will come up on our agenda later for a vote. Okay, Thank thanks. you. Okay. Next item on our agenda is uh, policy development. First reading five thirty three wellness. See, Cindy's not here. Uh, are you going to talk on this, or is anyone? I know there was some oh. changes. 
is all outlined on red and given us. Is there any comments? So, um, Chair Yarrow, um, the last time that this policy was um, updated was March of uh, just last um, last spring, essentially March of 2017, and um, the National School Lunch and School Breakfast programs are required by the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2020 to have a wellness policy that includes standards and nutritious guidelines for foods and beverages made to students on campuses during the school day. And what you'll notice in this policy revision is that the, 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 the red language here provides more robust um, language and expectation around nutrition guidelines and um, expectation for school staff to meet those requirements. And this is the MSBA uh, recommended. You can see there uh, additions uh, to the policy. So I don't know if there are questions or comments on it. This is what MSBA is recommending. Jim? Well, I think just noticed a couple of typos. Should I mention them now or should I just send them to Cindy? Before the uh, yeah, I don't care. It's awesome. Why don't you just send them to, to Cindy? Okay. That would be great. Any other comments on this? This will come up again next meeting. All right. Hearing none, we'll move on. Okay, the next item on our agenda is the policy development second reading 612.1 development of parental involvement title one programs uh karen i know you had some comments that were addressed i appreciate you pointing that out uh early uh, i know there was some response what do you want to summarize so the point of policy 612.1 there there's two key components that we need to have parental and student involvement in, within and that's creation of the policy itself as well as some of the action plans that um, are put forth as a result of the policy. So when I was reading this over the weekend, I posed some questions to our superintendent and um, because I was at work all day, I did not have a chance to read all of the responses that came in to my questions. So perhaps um, Aston and Lisa Green can comment a little bit. Um, but my hope was that as we do this community process, we really build in time for that parent and student input in this process. Um, I, I can start off and then Lisa can provide some additional context as well. And um, I, I appreciate the, the questions that you posed. And what I was able to, to gather based on our current practices is that we, we currently have systems in place for parent, robust parent input, but um, based on the policy language here, we're gonna need to develop stronger systems around intentionally getting feedback from students. We currently um, do that more informally, and um, this is going to, this language will drive us to have to have more intentional strategies to get the feedback around the Title I programming from students specifically, but we do, from a um, parent standpoint, have a, have a plan in place and very intentional in nature to get parent input. Is there anything in the, in the language that's problematic or troubling? Because, you know, if adopted, then we're going to have to follow our policy, so. Um, you're looking at me, but actually, um, Aston uh, has been working with Frida, who really is our Title I person. So she, um, and I was listening to their conversation, and Frida's got a, a really good plan, very up to date, right up until like last Wednesday, and in incorporating things that we're doing in the district as far as uh, parent uh, input and bringing in some of that student input. So um, I don't want to speak for everybody, but it seems like you know we're, we're really moving forward on a plan to get that input that we need. And, and if I can add, uh, um, some of the 
some of the challenges around particularly parent and the student input is that it's very adaptive. Um, it's, it's very adaptive from the standpoint that we, we schedule meetings and what we've, what we've seen over time is that not, parents don't always respond to the formal meetings that we set. So one of the things that uh, Frida and her team have been doing is try, trying to be more adaptive in getting information from parents. So trying to meet them, meet their needs, be more responsive. Um, so we're, we're still trying to formalize what that can look like, being that it doesn't fit the traditional mode of we schedule a meeting and you know parents come. We're, we're trying to find different strategies to, to be responsive to their needs and meet them in, in areas or environments or wherever it may be that, that that's most comfortable and um, supportive of their needs. Right. Is there a concern, is this something that you'd want to continue or are you comfortable based on what, uh, on, on going ahead? Um, I'm willing to go ahead, but I at some point would like the uh, update from Frida and her team as to how exact we were doing the planning. And I, I think that can wait a few months. So we can adopt the recommended plan and then that's the follow-up is how do we implement it. So that's policy. Okay. Nancy. Yeah, um, last time I looked at this, I had question not just renaming the policy parent guardian, adding the word guardian and family engagement, but also including that in the description where we talk in the policy about family, about parent and family engagement, having it read parent, guardian, and family engagement. And um, my memory is that Cindy was going to check with the MSBA or wherever we got this and see if that was doable, not doable, if they had some concerns we didn't know about. She's not here. I don't know if we have an answer to that, and I'm wondering if we should just table this till she's back with us and we get an answer to that question. Yeah, we, we can certainly table it to the next meeting um, and bring it back for a third reading. Um, and at that time, if, if we choose, I can certainly, Frida can be prepared to share more information as well if that will be helpful. We don't know the answer to the question. I know she's going to check with so. counsel. Okay. Okay. Any other comments on this item all right that brings us to the uh, consent agenda uh, is recommended that the school board approve this evening's consent agenda is there a motion moved by Ken seconded by Jim Benneke All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes 7-0. Next item, we move to the action agenda. It is recommended that the school board approve the 2017 audit as presented. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Moved by Bruce. Second. Seconded by Karen. Any comments? All right, again, nice job, Sandy, staff. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 7-0. Next item, construction management as agent approval. It's recommended that the school board approve Krauss Anderson as the construction management agent as presented. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. moved by Karen. Great. Seconded by Ken. Any further comment? Discussion? All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? That item passes 7-0. Next item on our action agenda, the 2018-19 open enrollment affirmation it is recommended that the school board approve the 2018-2019 open enrollment affirmation as presented. I know this is an annual item. Uh, are you going to pre present on that, Aston? Or? Yeah. I know we do this annually to make sure we meet the the guidelines at all our schools to allow open enrollment, right? So exactly, it's it's something we have to do every year as a requirement um, that we approve this um, policy again that we we haven't changed. Um, so the board has it before them, and it's just being asked to approve um, what we have done in the past. Okay, is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Jim Beneke. Second. Seconded by Joe. Any comment? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 
That passes 7-0. The next item is the policy development second reading approval 612.1, development of parental involvement Title I programs, renamed parent, guardian, and family engagement policies for Title I programs. Uh, although it has been recommended the school board approve policy 612.1, I think through our discussion we thought that maybe we continue this till next item. Is there someone who wants to uh, move the continuance? All right, moved by Nancy, seconded by Karen. Comment? All right, um, all those in favor say aye. Aye, aye opposed. That item passes 7 0. We'll see that again and Hopefully we'll have an answer to our question about the impact of adding guardian in the name and in the policy, if there's any uh, uh, risk or that we're not aware of on that item. And also maybe just get a brief, uh, I don't know that we need any, but a brief thought from, from Frida what, what kinds of plans are, sh that she has uh, for getting the, the, the both parental, I guess, and child input, student input, so great. All right. All right, sorry, going fast. Uh, all right, next item is our employment contract approval, school nutrition 2017-18 and 2018-19. It's recommended the school board approve the employment agreement between independent school district number 283 and the SEIU School Nutrition Employee Group for the 2718, so that's the current and next 2018-19 school years as presented. Rick. Chair, members of the board, superintendent, um, um, as you mentioned, this is uh, one of our labor agreements with the school nutrition group, uh, Cooks, Lead Cooks. Um, uh, good settlement, I think, for both sides, uh, meaning there was a lot of good exchanges, give and take. We fixed things inside the contract. We made some adjustments to salary, health insurance, um, settled within um, what we had as parameters from the board uh, on this one. Uh, looking forward, we uh, put some things in knowing that we're going to be transitioning uh, to more scratch cooking to provide additional uh, workshops or training days um, for the group as we move forward and outside of the contract, uh, kind of more as a meet and confer, we talked about um, you know, how we're gonna move from the titles we have to the titles that we're gonna need in the future and um, the training plan for how do we bring on a chef and uh, make that selection and then make sure that they're ready um, to do the kind of cooking that we're gonna need about uh, 18 months or so uh, from now as we start to um, um, update the, the kitchen and, and move to some of more of that scratch cooking. Um, that's a pretty standard, but um, uh, it's, I, think we're, I think you'll be pleased with the contract. All right, any questions or, right, go ahead, Ken. Um, I like that we're putting something, provisions in there for our future in that um, there will be a higher demand of those guys and things. So um, it's great that they expect it coming and that we're moving forward with this uh, scratch cook. Okay, uh, is there a motion? So moved. moved by Ken. Second. Seconded by Jim. Any further comment? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes 7-0. On to uh, communications and transmittals. Karen. So, um, thank you. I'd like to point out um, Children First Asset Number Seven, how the community values youth. And there's a really special event coming up on Wednesday, November 29th. Money Paws Cheesecake is owned by Tammy Cabrera, a parent here in the district. Her four kids attend our schools. And every year she does this cheesecake sampling and all the proceeds go to Benefits Step. And that um, is a community service organization that totally benefits our families and kids. So if you can go to Muddy Paws, um, it's located at 7600 West 27th Street from 4 to 9 p.m. on Wednesday the 29th. 
you will not only get delicious dessert, but you will be supporting numerous um, organizations that benefit our students. So thank you, Tammy, for all the work you do on behalf of our community. Could you repeat that time? And it's this this yep. Wednesday. This Wednesday, four to nine p.m. at her bakery. Um, it's tucked in that cul-de-sac, past the post office. Yeah. And it, they do have great cheesecake. <laughs> great cause and happy, you know, but great, very good cheesecake too. So. All right, uh, any other communication to Bruce? On, uh, I have two things. One, on Sunday afternoon, I attended the uh, play, uh, Big Fish. Once again, our kids and the staff just do a fantastic job. Uh, I always go see the techies because without them, you don't see them and you don't hear them. These kids, you could see it all, you could hear them all. They just did an outstanding job on a play. And, and again, uh, Jody and, and her team just, just did a great job putting this thing together. And uh, I, again, the music, everything is so good. I, I just can't say enough about what they do. So I was very proud of that. Uh, the other thing I have to raise is a little bit different. Uh, last uh, meeting, we passed uh, the uh, policy 515, which is protection and privacy of pupil records. Uh, I didn't want to raise it last week, and, and I think passing it is the right thing to do. We, we did the right thing. However, the, the disclosure on section 11 of it, or XI, is disclosure of data to military recruitment officers. And, and I'm a veteran, so I, I do appreciate what the military does for us, and, I, and I'm not trying to talk anybody out of serving in the military, but there is a parental opt-out provision in that. So for our parents in St. Louis Park who do not want their this information sent out to military recruiters, they have an opt-out position in it. What my process was was to call up MSBA uh, to Kathy Miller, who's their policy person, and say, hey, can we make it the other way, that we don't send out the information unless there's an opt-in. Uh, again, if kids are interested in a military career, I encourage them. But at the same time, parents who do not want their children's information sent out to the military, uh, I also want parents to know. And when I was, when my kids were here, I didn't know there was an opt-out pos position that you could take. It's, I, what I would like to see is that it made more plain in our parental, you know, again, you're signing so many things when your kids come to school here, it's not one of the things that you would notice because it's down in the small print. And in most school districts, that's the way it is. Uh, but I simply, as a member of the St. Louis Park community, I want the community to know that there is that opt-out provision within our policy and within federal law. And because to make it the other way around where you had to opt in, we'd have to change federal law and I've been trying to do that for 10 years. That, that's hard to do. But in this case, I want it made clear to our parents that there is an opt-out provision for disclosure of data to military recruitment officers. Okay, Nancy. Actually, I'm gonna just echo a couple of your things. I like that it's an opt-out, but I also like your idea that we publicize that so parents, are, parents and students are aware of, of what their choices are. I have to echo um, the Big Fish production. It was fantastic. It was just such a fun night. The best ticket price in town for a great production. It was just a treat. And I just want to, you know, I know we don't have a lot of meetings left with Bruce on the board, and I just want to take this moment to thank you for being such a force for getting our audio system upgraded in the auditorium so we could actually hear the fine production that was being done on the stage. So what, once again, I was grateful to you in this uh, Thanksgiving time of gratefulness and loved the production. That's funny, I've never heard him say anything about the sound system. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just reading through some uh, information this afternoon and it sounds like the um, a Polar Express train that came through last year, that was two hours late, um, is going to do it again December 10th 
and uh, Ted Mahoney is going to be on the train this time. And um, it sounds like it's going to be a great event, especially if it's not cold and rainy and they're on time. Yeah, December, December 10th on that and last year was bitterly cold. So hopefully we get a little better uh, weather for that. Awesome. All right. Anything else? Okay. I would entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. moved by Ken. Second. Seconded by Bruce. All those in favor say aye. Aye. aye opposed. That passes 7-0. We're adjourned. <laughs>